during week 195 of Brada's Branded Thoughts. Adam Dobbins of the Nebraska Hawks Nest stops by the show to talk transfer portal, Charlie Jones' decision to enter said portal, and also the state of Iowa basketball. Is Adam confident in the direction of the program? Iowa hasn't been to a Sweet 16 since 1999. Plus, Brian Ferentz, the elephant in the room as it relates to the Iowa football offense. All that and more during week 195 of Brada's Branded Thoughts. But first, a word from our sponsor. You may have heard of the real-life Hawkeye Man Cave known as Kinnick Under the Kitchen. Well, after lots of hard work, there's not much space left to paint. But the walls are exploding out for public consumption. Under the Kitchen is proud to announce that you can now purchase exclusive prints of some of your favorite Hawkeye legends, including wrestling great Spencer Lee, football players Tyler Goodson, Riley Moss, and Drew Tate, plus an all-in-one Murray family legacy print featuring Keegan, Chris, and Kenyon Murray himself. Signed and unsigned prints are available, making the perfect collectible or gift for any Hawkeye enthusiast. For more information on purchasing one of these outstanding Hawkeye prints, visit Under the Kitchen on Facebook. That's Under the Kitchen on Facebook. Week number 195, Brad has branded thoughts here at From the Hawkeye of the Storm, and I've got a special guest joining me today. We're kind of taking a break from our recruiting interviews and um, discussions on Iowa football and Iowa basketball. We're certainly going to cover those two items, but uh, we've got Adam Dobbins here of Nebraska Hawks Nest. Adam, uh, first of all, you're not in your uh, typical man cave with all the uh, uh, well-known memorabilia. Talk about uh, your current state of affairs. This is true. You're very observant. Um, we're in the process of moving to Omaha. We just got a, uh, a new uh, position there. So we're moving the family down there, got the, all of the memorabilia packed up and ready to go. And, you know, with Nebraska Hawks Nest, we're always trying to, you know, spread the Hawk, the Hawkeye gospel as much as possible. There's so much more people. I think like 75% of the population in Nebraska is in Omaha. So I got to get down there and, and, and do my Iowa work in the most populated area in Nebraska. If you take over Omaha, I think Lincoln might shut down. So uh, we're working you, on it. You hit Omaha first. Um, Adam, first, first of all, appreciate you jumping on. This is going to be different because you're usually on the other side of this. I mean, when's the last time you've been interviewed? You're usually the interviewer. Not for a while. Uh, we've taken a little bit of a break from the uh, Nebraska Hawks Nest podcast. Just everyone needed a little bit of a mental health break. We were really getting after it pretty hard there. And so we were like, hey, when it gets to the point where it's just to feel like a job, we need to dial it back a little bit. So we're, uh, we're just taking a break. But yeah, it's, it's been quite a while um, since I've done it, uh, anything from the other side. So this is going to be a little bit a little bit different for me. It feels weird not to be in control of everything. So I'm going to have to get used to this. <laughs> and you're not in your man cave. So you're out of your element. Well, I want to, I want to get down to the nitty gritty because certainly we can talk about your background for anybody that is not familiar with you. I guess we can cover that first, but I do want to get yeah. down to substance, Iowa football, Iowa basketball, recruiting, Charlie Jones, Alondo trader, a lot of a very newsy week in Hawkeye nation, Iowa baseball, not off to a great start, but time this, video posts it will will have known the result of round two but round one did not go well but first of all adam just give everybody a maybe a quick synopsis of if anybody's not familiar with nebraska hawks and how did you get started and yeah. when did your hawkeye fandom begin uh hawkeye fandom began at a very early age grew up in des moines going to hawkeye football games um caught the bug very young uh life ended up taking me out to nebraska and uh, long story short, just kept running into Hawkeye fans that were always like, I don't know any other Hawkeye fans out here. I don't have anyone to connect with. You know, I'll go to a dive bar and watch a game and they put a little TV in the corner for me and people throw stuff at me, you know, like I'm all on my own or people hide in their house and watch it by themselves. So um, I just kept hearing that year on year in and year out. So I um, got to the point where we were like, I just, we need to do something to unite everybody, really give Hawkeye fans a place in Nebraska to connect Western Iowa. It's grown larger than that at the, you know, at this point, but um, just really wanted to connect everyone and, you know, do some game watches and make people in Nebraska feel like that, Hey, you're not alone. You know, we got plenty of other Hawkeyes out here. And if you just look, you know, today you know, at the big 10 tournament, it's, flooded with black and gold we didn't get the result that we wanted but you know there's plenty of hawkeyes out there we just needed to create a forum for people to connect and know that they're not alone out here and certainly you you guys have done a tremendous job with uh 
former players and and uh, just tremendous discussions with the likes of you know Marvin McNutt and Drew Tate and Ricky Stans. You get on the list. So uh, your your platform has been enjoyable for me. YouTube, right? And then of course I, I had your Twitter your Twitter handle up here. I'm assuming you're the one in charge of uh, the Nebraska Hawks Nest Twitter account. Yeah, I, I'm in there. We got a group of us that kind of oversee everything and run it. Uh, so I'm not I'm not the only guy, but yeah, I am. Um, I guess if there was to be one person in charge, I guess I would be the guy, but I'm not really swinging the authority around too often. Don't need to. Well, I, I do want to ask you, get your authority on uh, just your thoughts, I guess, on uh, a very newsy week and not necessarily the best of news this week. Yeah. Um, and I'll, let's just address the elephant in the room, Adam, first. Uh, Charlie Jones entering the portal is huge, huge, huge news. And not just because he was all Big Ten, uh, the best kick uh, specialist, or you could argue the return specialist in the Big Ten, maybe one of the best in the country. I don't think there's any question he's one of the best in the country. Yeah. Um, he returned for his sixth year, passing an opportunity to maybe impress some scouts and make a, make a name for himself in the league early. And uh, we assume he's leaving. I mean, certainly he could come back. The rule is clear that he could come back if Iowa accepts him back and he chooses to do so. But I think it's likely he moves on. First of all, you just your initial thoughts on that news. Was that as blindsiding to you as it was to me? Uh, it was definitely blindsiding. Uh, Charlie, if you're listening, stay home stay home. Um, it, it was, it's understandable. At first I was, um, I went through the whole range of emotions. I was shocked. I was angry. I was upset because I love Charlie. Everybody loves Charlie. He's so exciting to watch on kickoffs, you know, playing receiver. But at the end of the day, um, you know, everyone is speculating as NIL money, you know, what's going on here. Everything that I've read and that I've dug into and the people that I've, that I've spoken with, he's just wanting to get more exposure and more wet reps at wide receiver. And, that's where he really sees himself at the next level. Um, he's one of the best return men in college football. He's been absolutely exciting to watch. And I, I hope to God he comes back. But at the end of the day, you want to put yourself in Charlie's shoes. And if Charlie's trying to make, take that next step to the NFL and he wants to get, you know, more, get scouts and coaches to be able to see him have more reps out on the field and, and get more experience – Iowa might not be the best place for him to do that. Uh, you know, right now he's sitting, he's not listed as a starter at wide receiver. So um, he's definitely going to get some playing time if he stays and he may, has made a ton of big plays at wide receiver, but you know, maybe he wants to go to a situation where he's going to be the guy. Um, you know, there's already speculation. He might end up at Purdue. Um, it, I, I don't know if that's true at all, but um I'm definitely sad to see him go. It's a, a definite playmaker that we could always use on special teams and offense. My, my thinking, and I shared a lot. I don't want to bore people on this because I did a two hour live show last night, just discussing the news. But um, Adam, I, I, I just be frank. I think he's the best receiver Iowa has right now. And that doesn't mean that Keegan Johnson and Arlen Bruce, their potential can't supersede what Charlie brings. But I think from everything I've heard and I, I've, heard from people within the program that have said that he has been by far the best deep threat this spring um and again i know depth charts don't mean a ton you mentioned the fact that uh, maybe he didn't perceive himself to be the, the clear-cut number one guy um but i do think he's the best deep threat and for a, an offense that's sputtering that i think the fans want more uh downfield action they want more ingenuity he's a guy who we've seen uh, with sweeps and taking stuff out of the backfield. Certainly his ability on special teams has been well-documented. So this is a big loss. I did hear somebody called in last night about the potential of a Notre Dame uh, possibly being a, a type of place. And I go both ways on this, Adam, because I could see it the way you just uh, uh, brought it up. I mean, he could go somewhere where he's just going to be the clear-cut number one receiver, but I also don't think he's going to be able to find a home at a really high major power five school where he's just the number one guy. Like he's not going to go to Ohio state and be the number one guy no. if he goes to Ohio state. He's probably not going to play on offense, quite frankly. And that's not no insult to Charlie Jones, but I could see him either go potentially trying to find a home that you might per, may perceive as a, a level below Iowa where he is the clear cut number one, or he may go to a Notre Dame an Ohio state, a Clemson and Alabama and just be a specialist because let's be honest, we've seen, some pretty incredible things from Charlie Jones as it relates to kick returning. And we've seen some over the years, you know, I think Josh Ribs, Devin Hester, Hester was a decent receiver, but these yeah. guys who have made a name for themselves in the league 
as specialists. And so, sure, for Charlie wants to play on offense, but do you think possibly he, he might be better off finding a home where he can really expose those skills specifically even more so than he was here at Iowa? I, I just think that, you know, and I have an extremely biased opinion. Um, I, I feel like he was one of our most, if not our most consistent wide receiver last year. I felt like we always could count on him I to agree. make a big play. I, I mean, he was phenomenal. Um, if you're Brian Ferentz, you really got to get on the phone or, you know, go to the kid's apartment and and get him to come back. I, I think, you know, just us not being able to produce on offense like we've wanted to for quite some time, you you, you lose a piece like that. It hurts really bad and then you know we have a lot of people saying too oh it's if you have to play in that offense or play with spencer you know or anything like that that's why he's leaving that's not that's not why he's leaving all of us with the level head realize that's not the case um you know he's just looking out for his best interest this is the world that we live in now where you essentially have to consistently recruit the guys on your own roster to stay and constantly be evaluating these guys i mean we got to have a guy on staff that's at all times, you know, checking the temperature in the room and finding out, okay, how's this guy feeling? If this guy's not, you know, fulfilled, he's going to have one foot out the door because of NIL or because of, you know, how many reps he's getting. He's not happy with that. You know, there's so many things that you got to do to keep a guy anymore. And uh, it's becoming tougher and tougher all the time to keep anyone happy. And I will agree with that. Um, Although I will say this, you brought it up earlier um, and I get what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not going to, imply that it's a direct i have no knowledge to say it's a direct result of oh he doesn't want to play with spencer petrus i'm not implying that at all but you did mention the fact that iowa is probably not the ideal location for someone who's trying to showcase a skill set like charlie no. jones has. i mean it's just not and so that is an indictment um on iowa's offense and i, I want to talk to you about the state of the program and if you, if you watch my show enough you know that i get ripped a lot for being uh, at least over the past few months, I've been very critical of Iowa football. Yeah. And for the record, anybody who knows me knows I'm a diehard Iowa fan. And I've, you know, you go back to last year, I'm one of the few people that I remember that said in August that Iowa would win the West. And I'm not trying to be braggadocious on that, but I'm just saying I, I'm not a hater. <laughs> yeah. But I do have, I, I do have some very uh, legit concerns about the state of Iowa football as it relates to the offensive side of the ball. I think a lot of fans do. And certainly that, that kind of goes along with this story on Charlie, but I just want to get your opinion. I know you're biased just like I am. Yeah. How confident are you in the current coaching staff? And I'm not talking just about Kirk, but the entire staff being able to make this an offense, which is pretty darn bad. Let's not sugarcoat it. When you're 123 in total offense, you're, you're pretty darn bad on that side of the ball, making that a from going from a bad offense to at least an average offense. Well, first of all, I want to preface what I'm going to say with just because you're critical of the program doesn't mean you're not a fan. Um, And I think there's a lot of people out there that if you if everything you say is not 100 percent positive, it makes means you're a bad fan and go like Iowa State or go root for Nebraska. That's not how it works. If you're a fan and you want better and expect better and feel like that we can perform better, which I do as well. I agree with a heck of a lot more than what you say than I disagree with. And. I think that makes that that doesn't make you a bad fan if you speak your mind. Um, with, with the state of the program, you know, you said a lot of things that are very frustrating. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I think Spencer Petrus is a Petrus is a phenomenal kid, a wonderful person. Everyone that ever interacts with him has nothing but positive things to say about him. He's a great human being. Um, the horrible things that are said to him on social media are ridiculous yeah i mean people like that like grow up he's a kid okay like that kind of thing shouldn't be happening to any sort of college player no matter what and even if he's making nil money you you know let's let's be at least be classy about it but i don't feel from from what i've seen and the sample sizes that he's got the skill set to be able to get us to where we need to go um and everyone says well we, we won 10 games last year to be honest with you, Corey, I feel like we won a lot of those in spite of the quarterback play. Um, that, that's yeah. not. You, but let me just say that you're not going on a limb saying that. Like people think yeah. that you know we we know we give way too much credit to quarterbacks, we give way too much blame to quarterbacks. But you know it's it's it, the football. The football is not rocket science. Yeah, and um, it, it's I think the numbers are are clear and the eye test is clear. Everything is clear 
that Iowa won 10 games in spite of the offense. I think you hit the nail on the head. My biggest problem with this coaching staff from beginning to end, from the beginning of the tenure till now, is I have a lot more positives I could say about this staff than negatives by far. But the biggest is the inability to assess the quarterback position. Um, it frustrates me to no end. Uh, I know it frustrates a lot of fans. I mean, that there was ever any sort of um, thought process about whether – Jake Christensen or Ricky Stanzi should have been the starter. You struggled with that decision. That's insanity to me. You know, like once you see the the results on the field, you're struggling with CJ Beathard versus Jake Rudock, insanity. I mean, that you're not there. I don't feel like that they're able to make strong, sound decisions when it comes to the quarterback position. We don't really seem to ever have a mobile quarterback. I don't, you know, Drew Tate was maybe a little bit mobile, but the last one I can r- really remember a true dual threat was Brad Banks. Well, we went to the Orange Bowl that time, you know, that year when he was there. We, we typically have these guys with concrete blocks strapped around their ankles with strong arms. And anymore in the, in the climate of college football, if you want to be able to win consistently, you got to be able to have a quarterback who's, who's dual threat. Because let's be honest, I'm going to say right now, our wide receiver room is probably as deep as it's ever been since I've been a Hawkeye fan. I, I'm pretty blown away, thankful, and shocked that we have the talent that we have. But for the most part, what's been a huge problem with our offense over the years? The wide receivers didn't get do great at getting separation over the years because we're not getting elite talent in there. What does what, what your common sense tell you? A quick way to fix that. Why don't we get a dual threat quarterback in that can maybe take off and run with it? And we've never seemed to be able to do that. Um, again, so many positive things you can say about Kirk. He's been a phenomenal coach. Uh, un- unbelievable at developing talent and unbelievable at fi- finding diamonds in the rough. But also when you have a coach, you know, say, okay, a little bit of like a Joe Paterno, you get a guy that's stuck in his ways. That's like, Hey, this is the way it needs to be. This is the type of guy we want to, you know, play in this system. It- it's hard to get guys like that to take off their blinders and open up and and think about things in a little bit more of a broad, a broad perspective. So, you know, I'll be honest with you, as far as like the staff as a whole, I'm extremely satisfied. You know, I, I feel like you know, the special teams is coached at a level that, you know, no other Big Ten team can even touch. Our special teams is phenomenal. I think, you know, Coach Woods is going to be a big time head coach someday. I don't even need to touch base on our defense. Our defense is one of the most elite defenses in the country. Phil Parker, I can't believe there's people not knocking down his door to become a head coach. That he hasn't won the Broyles Award is insane to me. Um it's our offense and it's been consistently our offense. And, you know, the thing is that's the style we want to play because it sets things up. We looked at, you know, at this, at the citrus bowl, you know, you look at, you know, how that game ended. We put so much pressure on the back of the defense because we had such little confidence in what our offense could produce that the defense, one of the most elite in the country cracked at the end. And we lost the game because of our inability to even want to do anything with the ball. I mean, I'm sitting in the third row on the 45 yard line, watching us just hike the ball and pretty much lay on the ground to try to run out as much clock as possible and pray that our defense can win the game for us. It's, it's frustrating. It's head scratching. And, you know, you don't want to be like, Hey, I'm one of those armchair quarterbacks. You know, they put these guys in these positions you're there for a reason. You know, you're paid big money for a reason, you know, your stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, it's the quarterback position that we can't seem to really get right. You hear about all these guys when they're coming in, like that they're, they're going to be studs. And then whenever they get here, we don't see the development and see them progress to the player that we hear about them potentially, you know, becoming throughout their four years. And I think it's complicated by the fact that uh, a couple things you, you have situations like with Spencer Peters, where Iowa clearly picked Spencer over Zach Wilson. They said, no, we're, we're, we're going to uh, re- recruit. Basically, they had to make a decision. If you know the, the background of that story, they had to make a decision between recruiting, getting Spencer Petrus on campus, getting Zach Wilson on campus. They picked Spencer Petrus. Zach Wilson ends up being phenomenal at BYU and is now the starter for the New York Jets. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know Matt, Matt Regal, want to go back further. Matt Ryan's another example of a guy that uh, yeah. Iowa could have potentially had and we know the what happened from there on out the rest of that story i also gets complicated by the fact you brought up the mobile quarterback situation and i had this conversation with someone the other day um and it, it relates to brad banks so you, you may have heard brian ference adam here earlier this spring was asked specifically about 
the the numbers from Brad Banks during his phenomenal 2002 regular season. And basically the question was posed to Brian, and I don't have a, the, the quote in front of me. Basically the question was posed to Brian, are these the ideal numbers you want from a quarterback if, if you had your dream scenario? And keep in mind that Iowa won a Big Ten championship. Uh, Brad Banks, I mean, I, I can pull up the numbers. Brad Banks was absolutely sensational, as you know, yeah. um, during that 22 season. Let me just pull up the the numbers here. I'm just doing this on the fly as we're talking. Um, but here, here are the numbers from 2002 for Brad Banks. So through the air, he threw for nearly 2,600 yards, um, averaged nine yards an attempt, a 157 passer rating. Um, his completion percentage actually wasn't even that great. It was at 58%. But here's here's the kicker, and as, as you know, he, he had the ability to make plays on, on, with his feet, which is something that we haven't really, minus maybe C.J. Beathard and, and even Drew Tate at times, nothing close to what Brad brought to the table. And certainly sack yardage is adjusted here. 423 yards on the ground that season for Brad Banks. And again, that's not that's that's including sack yardage taken away from that number. So that's a an, an ridiculously good number. And Brian Ferentz was asked, is this your ideal stat line? And his response was, well, preferably not. We, we want a facilitator. You know, we want to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands as quickly as possible. And I, I know that was talked about a little bit, but when I heard that quote from Brian Ferentz, I about fell out my seat hmm. for so many different reasons. A, because it defies logic. B, look at the, you know, you look at uh, some of the best quarterbacks in the league right now. You got Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Josh Allen. These are guys who can make plays with their feet. Right. And certainly Aaron yeah. Rodgers, I don't know that he'd I'd be considered dual threat, but Aaron Rodgers is not a statue. Um, yeah. and, and I know everybody's going, well, look at Tom Brady. We, we can always use an outlier. Right. And Tom Brady's been blessed by guys like Tristan Wirfs for much of his career. We know. Yeah. That. Um, and he's sensational. No question about it. But I, I was shocked by that. And what the problem with making a statement like that as well is why would you as a playmaking quarterback? ever consider wanting coming to Iowa when you hear you're you're not only your offensive coordinator but now he's your position coach who by the way also admitted that he doesn't know how to throw a football say that we don't want playmakers we want facilitators at the quarterback position I, I was baffled by that so I'm just curious your thoughts yeah um I, I heard the same as well and I, you know again I want to preface this with I, I think Brian Ferentz is one of the nicest individuals I've ever met sure. I mean the guy is as classy and cordial as you're ever going to meet. Yeah. Um, it baffles me as well. I mean, why wouldn't you want a guy that could do both? And that's the problem is, you know, you want to be able to get your the defense on their heels. You know, you want to be able to think, you know, this is simple football logic, you know. Um, and my frustration about the whole thing too is, okay, Corey, you have common sense. You're Say you're Spencer Patriots, okay, it's the off season. Um, what, what's maybe one thing, one element to your game that you really think you should probably improve on? Maybe be able to run the ball a little bit if you need to. I'd be running sprints. I'd be doing agility drills. I'd be doing the dot draw. I'd be working with strength and conditioning to, you know what? I, you know, if you're Spencer, you're never going to become a, a insane dual quarterback. We don't expect that out of him. But what we do expect out of a Division One quarterback in the Big Ten is that the pocket collapses, you're aware of it, and you can take off if you need to and pick up four or five yards and not get sacked for six or seven every single time that happens. Um, that would be at the top of my list of, of ways to develop. That way, a lot more is going to open up on – you know, on offense, when you're looking down the field, you know, if those safeties and those corners, corners feel like, hey, you know, this guy can take off if, if we're not ready. No, they have no fear of that whatsoever. They can lock in and just focus on their, their job, and they don't have to worry one bit about him running out of the pocket. Once the ball's in his hands, he's either throwing it away or he's going to try to throw the ball downfield. And, you know, that's the frustrating part. And a lot of what Brian says, like what you referred to, um, I'm not in those rooms. I'm not in those meetings that they have. How much of that is him and how much of that is Kirk? That's the thing that I can't ever decipher. Is that Brian's true feelings on the whole thing? Because you got to think from Brian's perspective, he, he clearly wants to be a head coach. What the product that he's been putting on the field offensively, that's not going to happen in, in the Big Ten. You know, hopefully not. Um, if you're wanting to become a head coach in the Big Ten and be the successor to, to Kirk, 
you're going to have to open up the offense and figure out some things and, and evolve a little bit and start producing at a little at a level that the program's not winning in spite of you. Okay, you need to at least complement the defense and uh, you know not dig them and put them in holes uh, consistently. Um, and, and if you're Brian and you're not able to to get those opportunities, why would you not go to somewhere like the MAC and take a head coaching job for three or four years, prove that you know you're able to do things on your own, um, that you're, maybe your philosophy isn't the same as your dad's, that you, you can you can win, then come back and take the head coaching job. I would feel a lot better about uh, Brian taking the head coaching position. If he was to go someplace like a Toledo or a Kent state um, or, you know, a ball state, something like that and, and have some success. I'll just speak Frank. What, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. I don't know why anybody um, in their right mind and that maybe is being a little harsh, but why anybody in their right mind would sit here and say that, that Brian Ferentz has proven himself to be the best candidate to be the next head coach. I, I still don't even know why people are having that conversation. Maybe people aren't having that conversation, but um, w- there has been nothing from an offensive perspective that has convinced me that, that Brian is cut out to be a Big Ten head coach. Maybe he will at some point. I give him credit for what he did at New England. He had a record-breaking year at tight end with Rob Gronkowski and, and Aaron Hernandez. He's coaching quarterbacks at Iowa, all right? He's a guy who admitted that he he's never thrown a, a, a pass. I'm curious as your thoughts on the, the quarterback coaching hire. Um, I know you like Brian Ferentz, but what were your thoughts on that? I was disappointed, but I was also not surprised at all. Um, I know that our quarterbacks have been going out to the East Coast, and I, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Been, yes. Why did he not get the job? Um, you're sending your guys out to the East Coast to work with a guy on a consistent basis. Um, you clearly have confidence in him from a quarterback coaching perspective. You're going to put a guy that's um, a, a former offensive lineman, coached a hot second at tight ends, and has you know been our been our offensive coordinator at a, at a mediocre pace for however many years to coach the quarterbacks. That to me. It's head scratching. I, I didn't understand that at all. I don't think anybody did. And I think a lot of people are pretty salty about that. Why would you not go out and get Cassiope? Like, why would you not get this guy that's working with our quarterbacks? And just if he's that good and you're sending guys out there to work with him, why wouldn't you just have him in house? And so he's not working with anyone else. We have him just with our guys. Well, here's my question, Adam. I'll be devil's advocate on that, on that theory. So we think he's that. So we, I'm saying we as in the coaching staff, must think Tony Rassiopi is a, a really darn good quarterback's coach. We think that. But we also, this is the same coaching staff that doesn't know how to evaluate quarterbacks, doesn't know how to develop quarterbacks themselves, and hasn't had successful quarterback play in years. Yeah. And yes, I everybody wants to point it. Well, Tony Rassiopi and, and uh, what's his face? Pickett, Kenny Pickett. Well, he developed Kenny Pickett. Well, Mark Whipple was also Kenny yeah. Pickett's. Uh, position coach and guess what now he's you'll see it at nebraska so i'm not trying to take any i don't know enough about rassi to really make a judgment call but you and i both know there were other options out there but it's 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 doubling down it's saying we're we're, i'm going all in on my son and you know chuck long i I brought this up before on this show but uh, chuck long um during a a radio show here uh about a month or two ago um he called it nepotism i mean this is chuck long calling it nepotism and yeah so, you know, I've always been hesitant to use that terminology, but what else is it when you have a guy that's not that's not performing at his current position and he gets elevated, he gets promoted? So I'm going to support him just like you because I'm a fan first. I'm going to yeah. support the quarterback play. And, and for, for the record, I, I you know, I, I try to avoid going after a guy like Spencer Petrus because Spencer Petrus is not the problem. Okay, the problem is with development of these kids like Spencer yeah. Petrus. Alex Padilla didn't set the world on fire when he when he was in the game, and I have no reason to believe that Joey Labus. I know some people think that Labus is the answer. I have no reason yet to believe that he's going to light the world on fire coming into the game. They need these guys to develop. Got to be able to evaluate talent and, and certainly complement that offense. And right now, or complement the defense. Right now, I think you and I both agree. You may think you're playing complementary football, but you're going three and out almost. You know. <laughs> a drive in drive out basis that's not complimentary football complimentary football you can play complimentary football you gotta be able to run the ball you gotta be able to move the chains control yeah. time of possession and you can't do that if if you, you can't throw the ball you know you're you're drawn up third and five third and nine pass plays for five yards 
Um, we were, we're hearing all these awesome things about Labus, uh, and, and you know, hopefully for good reason. I am not getting overly excited for the fact that I've been through this a million times with who, yeah. whoever's not playing is, you know, Absolutely. is so darn good. Like this guy's a stud. And then he gets in there and it's like, all right, a little bit more of the same of the same thing as usual, a lack of development at the quarterback position again. So I, I've, I've ridden this roller coaster, been on this ride a few times. Um, I, I'm just at the point where I'm just like, okay, let's just see what happens on the field because I, you know, I'm not going to get all worked up and frustrated um, about a guy that's, you know, the third string quarterback. And then, you know, the fans, myself, you know, being one of them in the past, scratching, clawing, like, let's get him in, let's get him in. This guy's supposed to be a stud. And then he gets in and, hey, it's just more of the same thing again. And I'm not saying that, you know, that's what he's going to do. I hope Joey comes in and lights the world on fire when he gets, gets a chance. Um, and I hope Brian becomes is the best quarterbacks coach. Absolutely. In Absolutely. America, I hope I'm wrong as hell. I hope he completely proves me wrong. I, I would love to see Brian run one, you know, a top 50, top 60 offense in the country and become the head coach and be successful. I'm not rooting for him to fail. I want him to kill it. But the the proof's in the pudding, as they say. And uh, I, I just, I, I think us as fans and, you know, like you said, you're a fan too, just because, you know, you're pessimistic from what you've seen doesn't mean you're not a fan. It'd be nice to see our football program win and not win in spite of the offense for once um, and have a little bit more of a, you know, it, it, that's fine if we don't have a top 20 offense, let's just not have a bottom third offense in the country and see what we can do. And I think we're looking at the, if we're looking at Brian Ferentz to be the next head coach, I think we're looking at the wrong coordinator um yeah you brought this up earlier you impl- uh, and i, I want to move on to the last 10 15 minutes of our show um if you had to pick one year under kirk ferentz where iowa's offense was actually like flashy and good what year would you pick that's a hell of a question um i, I would see what the numbers say but i want to hear what you think from an eye test first um i would have to say and I look back and I remember being frustrated a lot during this year, but I would say um, Rick, uh, Stanzi's junior year when okay. we beat Georgia oh, Tech in the Orange Bowl. Sure. But I remember there being times like the Michigan State game. That was a super low scoring game yes, and we won at the last second. So I, I'm sure the numbers don't support that, but that's one of the, oddly enough, one of the first ones that jumps to my mind. Well, just really good skill position talent that year. And they struggled to run the ball with Adam Robinson and Brandon Wager at times. But when you have Marvin McNutt, and you have, you know, Trey Strauss and DJK, and you've got Tony Moyaki, some of the best skill position talent all in, in, in on one team that Iowa's had. But I would venture to say it was 2002. Um, yeah. the numbers, I think, would probably say Iowa's offense was the best under, again, I'd have to go all the way back to 99 and, and trace it through 21. But I last checked that those, those were the most impressive numbers. And what's the one difference in 2002 between every other year? And it's, a quarterback who has the ability to, first of all, an elite quarterback who was a Heisman finalist and who has the ability to make plays on his feet, and yet Iowa doesn't want to uh, have a playmaker quarterback. Doesn't make much sense. I do want to move to, to basketball, though, because um, certainly recruiting is in, in full flux right now. Transfer portal's been active. We know Iowa loses to Joe Toussaint. Um, I, I still don't know what Austin Nash is going to do. Everybody thinks he's leaving. I, I wouldn't be shocked to see him come back because Iowa's going to have scholarships available. Yeah. So he may come back for another year. I mean, who knows? Um, Josh Gundley comes back after entering the, entering the portal initially. Iowa has swung and missed on Fardaz Amak, Theo Akuba. They've been linked to a couple other big men. I've been told that it is absolutely 100% because of NIL. Iowa doesn't have a collective together, whether you like NIL or not. And I think you and I are in agreement that NIL needs a reformation. Yeah. We need to have the transfer portal. I don't know about overhauled, but it needs to be adju- adjusted. Um, but I will say this, I, I am pro Fran McCaffrey. I think Fran is working his tail off to recruit right now. And I know a lot of fans are frustrated by the, by the sweet 16, um, drought. And I get that. That's not all on Fran, but I understand the frustration. He's been here 12 years, but, um, you, you're hearing a different tone for me when we start talking basketball, because I do think Fran is swinging for the fences, but NIL is holding him back. Just your thoughts on Iowa struggles without a collective right now. 
Um, it's super frustrating, but I'm going to throw this at you and tell me what you think. Okay. College sports right now is in trouble. And with the NIL transfer portal, everything, it's getting to be more and more closer to professional sports. What's one thing that professional sports has to manage the league that college sports doesn't a salary cap. And that's something with NIL that we definitely need to institute because that's been the biggest problem with like college football, not as much college basketball, but college basketball too is, you know, mostly college football though, is you have those six or seven programs that are playing for a national championship every year. And then there's everyone else. And all this has done is widen that gap and taking, you know, two of the sports that are two of the best sports in the world and it's ruining them. And it's making it less fun for the fans to watch because you got schools like Iowa who, um, you know, Iowa athletics is extremely reputable and we're not able to compete with a lot of these schools because we don't have as big of a checkbook college. That's not what college sports is about. So if we're wanting to do an NIL type of situation and we want to survive in this landscape, those schools either are going to have to break off and do their own thing if we want this to be competitive, or we're going to have to put some sort of salary cap in place that you can only offer these kids, and these kids can only get so much money because a lot of this dirt is starting to rise up. You're seeing between Jimbo Fisher and, and Nick Saban. You know, they're two guys that are used to always getting their way. They have two of the biggest checkbooks in the country that are able to do a lot more than we're able to do at Iowa. Um, you're just going to continually see schools like that fight with each other and continually separate themselves from the, from, from the rest of the group. I've before this NIL stuff even started, um, you know, we had a little bit of a window where it was just the transfer portal was open. I have feel like continually one thing. I I feel like Fran's a great basketball coach. Um, I feel like, I I really hope that he's the guy and, you know, he's been here long enough, but in 10 years with, you know, he's, is he, Corey, is it his 10th season now? I think he's heading into, well, he came here in 2010. So I think we're looking at year 13, I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, at that point, if you haven't made one sweet 16 yet, that's that's a problem. You know, that's a problem. No matter how much we like you, no matter how much of a great guy you are and a great coach you are, my patience has run out. I'm going to be honest with you, um, whether it be NIL or recruiting before NIL even started, I haven't been extremely blown away with Fran's ability to recruit. I feel like we miss out on guys left and right. I mean, Dolph got suspended for airing his grievances about it on air during a game, which we all agreed with everything he said. Um, I don't, I, I don't doubt Fran's ability as a basketball coach. I do have severe doubt in his ability to recruit. Um, it's been proven. We've consistently lost out on guys. There's something missing in that whole piece. When it comes to postseason play in the NCAA tournament, we don't ever come out ready to play. We come out flat with no energy. And when we get the doors blown off us, most of the time, there is no excuse that we ever lose to Richmond university, especially on the hot streak that we were on in the big 10 tournament, the level that we were playing at, we could beat about anybody in the country that year. Um, but we also, show that we had a pretty low, low basement that season as well and a pretty high ceiling and the way that we were playing and we come out that flat against Richmond, there needs to be some analyzation going on with how you enter the NCAA tournament. Cause we come out flat. We came out flat the year before against grand Canyon. We didn't blow them out, you know, but then Oregon comes in and blows our doors off again. Like we just aren't competitive in the NCAA tournament. So there's a lot of things there with Fran that, you know, again, I think he's an amazing guy and um, I think they have a great family and he has done a lot of positive things uh, for the basketball program, more good than bad. But at this point, if you haven't hit the, hit the sweet 16, even one time to, to me, I, I'm not, I'm not writing any more contract extensions till I see a sweet 16. I understand your perspective with the, 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 debate I would have with you is I felt the same way heading into this year regarding the big 10 tournament. And I know people place different uh, importance on, on the Mar- on March madness and the NCAA tournament. So maybe I'm just not on, on the same page as everyone else, but Frank couldn't do nothing in the big 10 tournament, never won more than yeah. one game in a single big 10 tournament. They go in there this year and win the big 10 yeah. tournament. So I agree with you. They need to make a sweet 16. I'm not debating that, but I do think that Fran, deserves next year and I again he don't think he's even on the hot seat next year if he doesn't make a sweet 16 next year he's not going to be fired whether whether you yeah. or I or anyone else wants him to be he won't be but I think he needs to get there 
but I, I do think that inspired some confidence. And, and as it relates to recruiting, right now he is, and I know it sounds like I'm just trying to defend Fran. Um, I've been frustrated with Fran. I've called him out for the inability to play defense and his refusal to hire a defensive-minded assistant coach. Yeah. But with that being said, the defense did improve last year. And mm-hmm. although Iowa has missed on a lot of four- and five-star guys, the one thing I've appreciated about Fran is that he's willing to go for those five, four- and five-star guys. He was yeah. in hard on Trace Jackson Davis. He was in hard on Keon Brooks, on Aaron, uh, on Aaron Euless' brother, Tyler. So he's in on these kids. And, yeah, he's missed – you, you know, that's on him, right? Um, and certainly now with, with NIL, he's even more behind the curve because he's limited with what he can do. I'm not saying that he doesn't share any blame for some of these misses, but certainly Gary Barton, the administration, I think has to take a big part of that. That's, that's my opinion on, on the situation. Um, but he has swung and and missed. Um, but he's also developed guys. I mean, look yeah. at Luke Garza, I mean, the best player in the country, maybe two years in a row. Keegan Murray, best player, maybe the best player in the country this past year. And if Chris comes back, he might be the best player in the country this coming. I mean, seriously, he may be, he can develop into one of the best players in the country. So we, I guess what I want from fans, and I'm not saying you're not doing this, Adam, but I want fans to look at Iowa football and Iowa basketball from the same vantage point. And what I appreciate about Fran is that he swings for the fences. And sometimes I feel like maybe Kirk doesn't. And he yeah. just realized we talked about before we went on the air, some of the smaller town kids that that Iowa has nabbed here in 23 24 which is great and I hope they develop into great athletes but it's it just seems like maybe there's a different recruiting mindset but it's worked different ways for both programs no I I need to tell you this too Corey I can't tell you how many former athletes former football players that I've talked to off the record that are extremely frustrated about the coaching staff's refusal to go after those top tier recruits um, I can think of two or three specific instances where guys that have played at Iowa and we were talking before we're doing the interview and I'm not going to obviously say any names, but they were like, Hey, I had a friend of mine, a guy that was a four star or a five star that um, was interested in coming on a visit to Iowa and wanted to come see the facilities, meet the coaches and give it a chance. And they took it to the coaching staff, took it to Kirk and said, Hey, this guy, he, he wants to come visit. He wants to come meet, meet you guys. And, um, th- their response was, well, he's got offers from Michigan and Ohio state, like, and, and they don't even invite him on campus. It's called, a loser, it's called a losers. It's called a defeatist mentality. Yeah. In recruiting. Yeah. And, and the thing is like, okay, like, w- you know, we're too amazing at developing talent, like amazing. I, I don't, it doesn't get a whole lot better than, than what we're doing. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, you know, y- if you want a plus results and you're studying, studying to get a B, you're not going to get that A+. plus. It's just never going to happen. Agreed. Uh, yeah. So uh, I completely agree with you, just the completely like unwillingness to go after these guys because they think, hey, we're Iowa. And I've heard Kirk say things like this before. It's just, you know, we're just Iowa. It's, it's Iowa. Yeah, it's, it's Iowa, but it's going to be just Iowa as long as we continue to talk about it that way. You ask a lot of us and a lot of people, we have pretty darn good facilities, some of the best fans in the country. You know, you go to that, you know, that Penn State game last year, you know, we're not going to get Xavier Wamka if he's not there at that game. Like, that's one of the best environments in college sports. I think the coaching staff, when they're out recruiting, needs to remember that sometimes. And I do think sometimes fans look, the, the perception is, well, Fran's missing on all these guys. Well, you don't miss if you never try. Yes. So, yeah. And I'll give him that. I 100% agree with you. And the one point I wanted to make, too, like devil's advocate to my previous point was, remember Tom Davis. Like, we were frustrated. People were a little frustrated with him. And then we get Steve Alford in here, absolutely. and we still we still haven't recovered from letting Tom coach Tom Davis go. And um, so I, I ask get you, it. I want to ask you, Adam, before we we sign off here, thoughts on Caden Proctor? Are you confident? Not confident right now? I know we're getting to the nitty gritty now of his recruitment. He announced some official visits, and Iowa not included. That doesn't mean they're out of the mix. He's been to Iowa a number of times. Yeah. But you're, just your your gut feeling on Caden? Not good. I don't think we're going to get him. I, I didn't feel good about it from the beginning, um, just from different things that he said and from interviews. I wish we could get him. Um, but there's certain kids, too, like they say, that just you grow up in Iowa, you live in Iowa, you just want to get out of state and experience something different. I wish that we could get him, but it just from everything that I'm hearing, um, and I don't know what you've heard, it just doesn't look good. I had a good gut feeling. Uh, I'm kind of back and forth now, and NIL is not going to help with these kids that are, that have offers to go just about anywhere. And I'm proud of Xavier Wampa for st- sticking home, and you hope yeah. you can hang on to these kids. But it is a free agency now. 
problem with salary cap, Adam, I'll just say this. I don't know how you do that without making them actually employees. I don't know how you can possibly. So there's a lot. It's a, it's a tangled mess right now. I agree. Yeah. It needs reformation. I think it's a bigger problem. My, my issue with Gary Barta is why go public about your complaints when your head coach, your head basketball coach is trying to recruit a big man. And you're talking about wanting to go, you, you're talking about wanting to advocate against the one-time transfer rule. So yeah, it's, it's, it's the um, PR at Iowa has not always been great. We know that. Yeah. Um, and the good news is Xavier Wampa is a, a, a really good get. You're, you're going to have, I think at least two to three years with him, assuming he sticks, sticks here. And Iowa has recruited at a very good level. 21 and 22 are both great classes and 23, yeah. 24 right now look pretty good. Now we've got a lot of, a lot of top recruits still across the country to make decisions that will change where Iowa's perceived, but overall looking pretty good. Adam Dobbins of Nebraska Hawks Nest. Adam, appreciate you taking the time. We'll have you on again. Um, yeah. This is kind of a, a mid season or a mid off season edition of the podcast, but uh, we'll have you again, maybe in anticipation of, of fall camp. Corey, I had a blast. Uh, you're doing great work. I love watching you, man. Keep it up. And I appreciate you having me on. All right, folks. Appreciate Adam Dobbins being here. This has been week 195 of Brad's Branded Thoughts. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Subscribe on Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast and here on YouTube. And we will talk to you soon.